Welcome back to our Sun Case of the Month series for June 2022. Feel free to comment below and I'll attempt to address any questions or concerns. This was my personal case, yet I grabbed one of our excellent residents, Dr. Silverberg, who assisted in the management. This case starts with an 82-year-old female presenting by medic secondary to a mechanical fall at home. She was noted to display an angulated right femur on scene was placed in a traction splint. She had severe pain associated with her injury and ketamine along with fentanyl were given by medic. Upon arrival to the emergency department, the patient was found to be in moderate distress, secondary to her pain. Her trauma did appear isolated to the right mid-thigh region. Imaging was obtained confirming the already suspected right mid-shaft femur fracture. The remainder of her trauma workup was negative. However, pain control was very challenging in this patient. It was difficult to dose her narcotic pain medication because she would transition from near apnea to screaming out in pain. Subdissociative dose ketamine was attempted yet did not appear to objectively impact her pain. Our attempts to adequately manage her pain were less than successful, which was clearly distressing to the patient, the family at bedside, and our entire care team. Even with a multimodal approach to pain and utilizing both narcotic and non-narcotic options, the patient's pain was not controlled. I knew we had to do better for the patient and subsequently considered the patient and her daughter for a nerve block. Many of you will likely be familiar with nerve blocks for acute pain management. If you are not, I strongly encourage expanding your practice and incorporate nerve blocks because in my opinion, they are sometimes the single best option for some patients. Your patients will benefit from a safe, effective, and easy to perform intervention. With this in mind, I can send the patient for a fascia iliaca nerve block. The fascia iliaca block is a plane block which targets the plane in which the nerve lives more so than the nerve itself. You will sometimes hear the term fascia iliaca block, femoral nerve block, and a 3-in-1 block used interchangeably. This is because they all target the femoral nerve. Even with the 3-in-1 block where you target the obturator and femoral cutaneous nerve, you only reliably block the femoral nerve. As I referenced, all these nerves can be affected with a plane block, yet only the femoral nerve is reliably blocked according to the evidence, and its innervation is what we target for most orthopedic pain control patients in the acute care setting. This picture shows the nerve dermatomal distribution of each specific nerve. While I haven't employed this block for soft tissue injury, laceration repair, or large abscess drainage, it would be an option to paint on skin location of the pathology. This image shows the expected distribution of the femoral nerve for bone innervation. Most commonly, the fascia iliaca block is utilized for pain management associated with hip fractures, yet based on nerve distribution, it can be utilized for mid-shaft femur fractures like our current case. The probe is positioned in line with the inguinal crease. I recommend a linear probe if possible given the superior resolution offered by the high-frequency probe, which allows better visualization of the important structures and fascial planes. I included this picture of a common nerve block setup. In this example, a 30cc syringe is attached to extension tubing so another set of hands can push the anesthetic while the proceduralist can more easily have fine motor control of the needle in one hand and the probe in the other. This allows easier direction of the needle to the proper location. In this setup, a spinal needle is being utilized. Now that we have a little knowledge of the nerve block offered to this patient, this is the first image obtained with a linear probe at the patient's inguinal crease. Even without experience with this block, this anatomy should look familiar to anyone who has performed a DBT study. The femoral vein is highlighted in blue, the femoral artery in red, and the nerve in yellow. The iliopsoas muscle is highlighted in orange. This one picture represents all the relevant anatomy required to perform a fascia iliaca block. As the operator feigns the area, the bifurcation of the femoral artery becomes evident. The majority of experts teaching this block recommend targeting the fascial plane above the level of the femoral artery bifurcation. In addition to recognition of anatomy and appreciation of fascial planes is essential to adequately perform this block. The vascular bundle is separated from the nerve by the fascia iliaca, hence the name given of the fascia iliaca plane block. For the block to be effective, you must get under the fascia iliaca since it is the space where the femoral nerve lives, where it sits on top of the iliopsoas muscle. Plane blocks often utilize around 30 cc's since this volume is being placed in the plane where the nerve lives rather than targeting the nerve specifically. This potentially gives a larger degree of safety since you stay farther away from the nerve and vascular bundle. While there is practice variation to the degree of sterile procedure employed for nerve blocks, I personally utilize a sterile probe cover, sterile ultrasound gel, and perform chlorohexidine skin prep at area. After utilizing this preparation, this is the first image I captured after Dr. Silberg started the procedure. The previously depicted anatomy is once again visualized, yet now we can start to see the tissue distortion from the needle entering the top left-hand aspect of the image. As the needle is entered deeper into the tissue, more clear visualization is noted. A long axis technique is utilized so that the entirety of the needle can be visualized during the procedure. I teach to target the iliopsoas muscle a couple of centimeters lateral to where you suspect the femoral nerve to lie. 
While the needle can be visualized, I like to perform what is known as hydrodissection. This occurs when a small amount of local anesthetic is injected. The hypocoic fluid helps determine exactly where the needle tip is located. Additionally, that fluid can help dissect fascial planes and clarify anatomy if needed. The images presented for this case series and this case specifically are obtained during actual cases with the goal of patient care being primary. Obtaining the perfect example to present as part of a case is secondary. With that in mind, a critique of our technique would be that the needle is quite close to the nerve. In an ideal example, the needle tip would be more lateral and utilize more of the plane block concept. Not every patient has an anatomy this clear and the plane block is safer since the femoral nerve is not clearly identified in some patients. In this patient, anatomy was quite clear and it allowed Dr. Silverberg to completely surround the femoral nerve with local anesthetic. There is actually elevation of the nerve off the iliosus with fluid both superior and inferior to the nerve. Anatomy is once again depicted here with the fascia iliaca plane identified as well. There is fluid seen both superior and inferior to the plane. This represents the importance of working to ensure you get the needle deep to the fascia since that is the area in which the nerve lives. And the final image showing clear delineation of the fascial plane with hypocoic fluid in that area. I checked on the patient approximately 10 minutes later to assess her pain. I asked how her pain was doing. The patient stated what pain. The patient and her daughter at beds had to change places. The daughter was now crying because she was so happy that we finally had relief of her mother's pain. I utilize a long-acting local anesthetic for these blocks, yet a common critique from some is that what happens when the block wears off. I am not an anesthesiologist, and I'm not leaving in a catheter for continuous infusion. This is a valid concern. I check to see the amount of pain medication given up to the point the patient underwent surgical repair the next morning. From approximately 2 p.m. until 8 a.m. the next morning, the patient received a total of two oral pain pills. This exemplifies the importance of breaking that pain cycle and allowing time to achieve a multimodal approach to the patient's pain, an effect that often lasts well beyond the expected duration of even a long-acting local anesthetic. This case exemplifies the incredible value of what incorporation of nerve blocks in your practice can achieve. I was unable to achieve adequate pain control in the patient even with utilizing all my multimodal pain tricks. Without utilizing the block, this patient likely would have been miserable up until her surgical procedure the next day. I was able to make her pain-free and greatly improve her clinical course, one that only required two oral pain pills to keep her comfortable until her surgical intervention. Even with this success, I don't use a nerve block in all patients with a femur or hip fracture. Frankly, not all patients need the intervention, and some patients are adequately managed with our traditional approach. However, having the skill set to intervene on select patients can greatly improve patient care in my opinion. While this case represents a hybrid between a plane block and a nerve block targeting the femoral nerve, I do believe the plane block is likely the best choice for many users since you can stay safely away from the important structures and just utilize anatomy to your advantage. These are incredibly easy to perform, yet if utilizing a plane block approach, make sure to include enough volume because that volume is required to spread in that potential space where the nerve lives. Since plain blocks require large volumes and utilize long-acting local anesthetics, which are often more cardiotoxic, it is important to calculate maximum doses of any local anesthetic for the safety of our patients. Dilution with normal saline to achieve the desired volume without hitting a maximum dose of local anesthetic can be an option. While local anesthetic toxicity is quite rare, these patients should at least be on a cardiac monitor. Additionally, an appreciation of the CNS and cardiac side effects is important. CNS signs of toxicity are perioral numbness, metallic taste, muscle twitching, altered mental status, and seizures. These tend to precede cardiovascular effects with classic findings of sympathetic activation, with the most feared complication being ventricular arrhythmias. Supportive care and lipid rescue are the treatment for local anesthetic toxicity. Complications are rare, and I feel these blocks are very safe, yet, like any procedure, you should know the potential complications. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you can now better appreciate how nerve blocks have the potential to positively impact patient care. Feel free to comment below.